Anyhow, yeah, what I'm going to be talking about today is giving you an overview of what the Bible says on finances. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you nine different topics. And um, as I get on, we're going to cover each topic in about three minutes, four minutes. Um, if I get onto a topic that doesn't apply to you, I'd encourage you to consider listening, consider focusing in, um, because it'll be another minute or two, and I'll be on a topic that does, does apply to you. So here's the first thing I want you to take note of. It's interesting, if you look through Scripture, the Bible has about 500 verses on prayer, prayer about 500 verses on faith, and Howard Dayton, a fellow that started Crown Financial Ministries in the United States, did an in-depth study, and he found 2,350 verses on what the Bible says on money and material things. Incredible. Phenomenal amount of knowledge there. The other thing I've found in the last 34 years, I've had the privilege of counseling at least 10,000 people, and maybe 15 or 20. I, I counsel several every week. Um, and one thing I have found is that, generally speaking, most Christians, Bible-believing, born-again Christians, have limited knowledge of what the Bible says on finances. Um, they usually know something about tithing. But when it comes to things like what the Bible says on the dangers of debt, the admonition to save for future needs, uh, how to get out of debt, uh, godly versus worldly attitudes, or biblically-based estate planning, I find most Christians really have very limited knowledge of, of these areas. And there's so much wisdom in God's Word that we are not availing ourselves of, which is very unfortunate. So here's the first one I, topic I want to talk about. It's stewardship. What do the following verses say to you about the stewardship of your assets? Everything in the heavens and the earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. And Haggai 2.8, I love that scripture. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord Almighty. At that time, silver and gold was used as money. So what God is saying is the money is his. Psalms 24.1 and 2 says, The earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. When you really look at it, everything's God. Genesis 1, he created it all, and he's entrusted it to entrusted it to us. So the conclusion is God's the owner. We are stewards or managers of what God's entrusted to us while we're here on earth. And if you don't agree, think of what Paul said in 1 Timothy 6, we brought nothing into this world, we shall take nothing out of it. A split second after we die, we will realize we were just managers or stewards of what God's entrusted to us. God was the owner. We're going to leave it all behind. We're just managing it for the 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years that we're here on earth. And remember, our time here on earth compared to eternity is, is very short. So here's my definition of Christian stewardship. Acknowledging in heart and mind that God owns everything, and then using money and material things in accordance with God's principles and God's specific will. That's my, my definition. In Luke 22, 42, Jesus said, not my will, but yours be done. We need to make sure we're using the money God's entrusted to us according to his principles and, and his specific will. Think about Matthew and the parable of the talents. If you remember that parable, that's where the master who is God entrusted five talents to one servant, he entrusted two talents to another servant, and he entrusted one talent to a third servant. The scripture says that after a long time, a long time, perhaps a lifetime, the master returned and made the servant accountable, all three servants accountable, regardless of how much they had. They were all accountable to God as to what they had done with the funds that he had entrusted to them. It's interesting, if you look at the scripture, God didn't make them, a lot of Christians think I'm only accountable for the first 10% to tithe, I can do whatever I want with the rest. But these servants were accountable with respect to what they did with all of the money that God had entrusted to them, everything. Uh, Romans 14, 12 says, so then each of us will give account of ourselves to God. We will stand before the Lord one day. If you know Christ as Savior and Lord, you're certainly going to spend eternity in heaven, but it'll be a case of whether you're, you're, you're giving rewards or lack of rewards when we get to, um, get to heaven and stand before the Lord. So, okay, so the next topic I'd like to talk about is God's wisdom on debt. And here's the, some key points about God's wisdom on debt. First, it is not a sin to borrow. It's a sin to borrow, not repay. And also, if we borrow money and we don't pay it back, it's a bad testimony. If you go to Matthew 5, it says, Let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. What kind of a light in the world of darkness is a Christian who uh, doesn't pay their debts? It's not much of a testimony. So clearly from Scripture, if we borrow money, we have a responsibility as Christians to pay it back. The second point I'd like to make on what the Bible says on debt is that God discourages debt and he warns of the dangers of debt. Proverbs 22, 7 says the borrower is servant to the lender. Servant to the lender? Let me give you a few examples. 
A wife cannot stay at home with the kids because she has to continue to work full time in order to service their debts. Often young couples take on big mortgages, car loan payments and all kinds of different types of debt and, and often they get stuck. They, they become a servant to the lender. A husband may feel at some point, or a wife, someone may feel led to go into full-time ministry. But I've seen so many cases where they've been prevented from doing that because they have to keep their full-time secular job with a higher pay in order to service the debts. And of course, debt, especially the accumulation of debt, causes stress, sleepless nights, and often causes problems um, in a marriage between husband and wife. The number of people I've counseled, unbelievable, where the number one stress in their marriage is finances is incredible, yet it's so unfortunate because most Christians I find are violating God's word on finances unknowingly. They just don't know what it says, so they're not following it. And it's something that can be easily solved if both husband and wife learn and apply what God says on finances. We've had the privilege of... Um, helping hundreds, certainly hundreds of marriages reheal. And I know nothing about marriage counseling, but I do know about what God says on finances. And if finances is the number one area of stress, which it so often is, if they'll both learn God's way of managing money, if we can help solve that problem, often a lot of the rest of the uh, issues the husband and wife can work out and the marriage relationship can heal. Um, and I've seen this even when the, the husband may be a leader in the church. I had one two weeks ago where the husband was a pastor. And uh, he was spending like crazy, and she wasn't. Now, that they can go the other way around, but causing all kinds of problems. And their, their marriage is actually in serious trouble. Um, another thing to note, number three, is the pattern throughout Scripture is for God to provide for needs with no debt. If you go out throughout Scripture, God always provided for needs without any debt. Jesus fed the 5,000. Um, he didn't tell them to go and put it on the credit card or borrow. Through in the 40 years in the desert, uh, God provided manna to the Israelites and, and water. And uh, throughout Scripture, when God met a need, he did it with no debts. Another thing I'd say is this. This is a key Scripture, Matthew 6. Jesus said, So do not worry, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For your heavenly Father knows that you need them, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And I think it's important to note that what Jesus is saying, Put him first, he'll meet our needs, what we shall eat, drink, and wear. Um, but it's also important to note that nowhere in Scripture does God promise to meet our wants and desires. Um, sometimes he will, and I believe when he, he wants to meet your wants and desires, he'll provide the cash. But so often, it, 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 God has is, is promised to meet our needs. It's, all, it's funny when we sit down with individuals and couples and they've accumulated a lot of debt. And we, I ask them to go back and look at where they spent their money over the last three, four years. So often, a big percentage of what they spent money on were wants and desires. They were not needs. And... Um, and, and you can just see that, that people are getting, they're buying things that they really don't need with money they really don't have. But today, with credit cards, lines of credit, it's very easy to do. So um, the next point I'd like to make, before you borrow any money, prayerfully consider the following questions. Is this purchase a necessity? Have I prayed and asked God for his wisdom and his direction? Psalms 32 8, God said, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will counsel you and watch over you. God's promised to direct us. But unfortunately, what do, what do most Christians do? They go ahead and make the decision. Let's say their car is starting to wear out. Rather than pray and ask God to provide them with another car, maybe a good used one or whatever, instead what they do is they just go off to the dealership, get a car, 0% financing, thinking, well, the financing is available. God must be opening the door, you know, this kind of stuff. And, and really then often Christians pray later when they're in financial difficulty and ask God to bail them out or ask God to bless their decision. Another key question, have I given God a chance to provide the cash or a better alternative? Isaiah 64.4 says that God acts on behalf of those who wait for him. I've seen so many cases in the last 34 years where probably 70, 80 cars have been given. Just use a car for the gap. They've been given away. I know of one couple that had limited income. They had a, had a need for a car. And um, rather than praying, they just went off and did the 0% financing at the dealership. There was another couple in that same church that had a need for a car, and then there was another couple that had a car that was in good shape, only about 70,000 kilometers on it, and they felt led by the Lord to give it away. Well, who'd they give it to? They gave it to the couple that waited upon the Lord, is what ended up happening. God acts on behalf of those who wait for him. And the last thing, very important practical thing, 
have you developed and implemented a budget to ensure you can afford the loan payments? So often we see uh, an individual or a couple, they have a certain amount of money to put down, they go to the bank, he makes X, she makes Y, add it together with low interest rates, they get approved on a $600,000 mortgage, and maybe they got 50 to put down. And they say, honey, God's opened the door for us to buy a house for 650000 God's opened the door for us to borrow $600,000. That may not be God opening the door, that could be the enemy, Satan, tempting you to get into debt. And by the way, if borrowing and buying, and quote, stepping out of faith, out in faith with a loan, if that's stepping out in faith, the non-Christians are doing it every day. They're stepping out of faith, borrowing and buying. We have a whole mindset in our society today that's so different from 50 years ago, where today it's borrow and buy. If you go back in Canada 50, 60 years ago, basically you didn't borrow for anything but a house. And even then, you actually put down, normally it was about a 30 to 40% down payment. Um, there's a very different mindset today, and it can lead to a lot of problems. Also, be careful of re debt restructuring. What happens here is so often you see an individual or couple, they run up debt on, usually on their credit cards. And then what happens is they run it up on their credit cards, they perhaps go see the bank or they talk to a friend, they say, we can solve your problem. We'll just give you a personal line of credit against your home and pay off your credit cards. Husband and wives come out of the meeting, they say, honey, we've solved our financial problems. You haven't solved your problem, you treated the symptom. The underlying problem was that you were spending more than you're making on credit cards, and, and that's the, you gotta deal with that. Because so often we see cases where people spend, they run up their credit cards, they get a line of credit, they pay it off, two, three years later, they do the same, two, three years later, they do the same. And it's amazing how many people that I've sat down with where the debt on their home is greater than what they paid for. The home, the house they bought 20 years ago, you know, in Toronto, the houses have gone up a lot. They bought it 20 years ago for 200,000. It's worth 600 today, but the debt on the house is 350. There's something wrong there. It's telling you that you're using the equity in your home to finance a lifestyle you really cannot afford, and it's a very dangerous thing to do. Um, so Proverbs 22:3 says, "The wise man sees danger and takes refuge, but the foolish keep going and suffer for it." Unfortunately, many people just keep doing the same thing because the credit's available. Final question, before you make any major financial decision, are you experiencing God's peace regarding the proposed decision? Have you prayed? Have you waited upon the Lord? Have you developed a budget? Now are you experiencing God's peace before you make the decision? Again, discern and determine God's will before you make the financial decision, not afterwards. And if you're not experiencing God's peace in the area of finances, you're probably not managing money God's way. If you go to John 14, 27, Jesus said, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Do not be afraid. So there's our summary on what the Bible says on debt. And understand again, I'm not trying to say it's not a sin to borrow, it's a sin to borrow, not repay. But the emphasis in Scripture is towards minimal debt. Ideally, long term, is to have no debt. I can tell you when you get to retirement, the last thing you want is any debt. Um, the worldly perspective is to use debt freely. The whole concept of buy now uh, and pay later, which results in lots of debt. So what does the Bible say about saving? I'm going to go on to that. You can either borrow and buy, or you can save for future needs. Let's look at this key scripture, Proverbs 21:20. 20. The wise man saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. I'm going to repeat that one. The wise man saves for the future, but the foolish man spends whatever he gets. If you look at the statistics of people in Canada, the United States, and around the world, 80 to 90 percent of people fall into the foolish category. That is, they spend all their regular income. They have no savings, so when an unexpected automobile repair comes up, anybody ever had an un unexpected automobile repair? I sure have. Unexpected house repair. Or sometimes even when some expected expenses come up, like the annual insurance premiums or a vacation, it's because they haven't saved for it, what happens? It forces them into debt. And they, they just run those bad financial habits over a long time, and the debts just tend to, to go up and up and up. And uh, it's, just, it's just unfortunate. I'm going to, here's something to think about. God's perspective is to save for future needs. The world's perspective is to buy now and pay later. Very different. God's perspective, save for future needs. World's perspective, buy now, pay later. Let me give you something to think about. I'd like to challenge you here a bit. Since God is in control, Psalms 103.19 says, The Lord has established his throne in the heavens. His sovereignty rules over all. And since God has promised to meet our needs as we put him first, Philippians 4.19, Paul said, and my God will meet all your needs according to his glorious riches in Christ Jesus. It doesn't say my God in the bank or my God in the credit card company. It says my God will meet all your needs. Is it not reasonable then for Christians to trust God to meet their needs rather than relying on credit cards, personal lines of credit, and other loans? 
And the answer is a clear yes, and it's substantiated by Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. and all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct your paths. So here's a summary of what the Bible says on saving. The biblical perspective is to use minimal debt and save regularly for future needs and be content with God's provision and timing. Godliness with contentment is great gain, Paul said. Be content. How many advertisements do you see on TV that are encouraging you to be content? Like it's, in the world, it's, it's the total opposite. They want you to be discontent so you'll buy their product. What's the worldly perspective? The worldly perspective is use debt freely, buy now, pay later, and the whole, I call it a financial deception that smart people use other people's money. The truth is, the biblical perspective is, smart people don't use other people's money. They use as little debt as possible and they pay it off as quickly as possible. I'm not an academic. I know that for most individuals and couples, they're gonna to have to borrow to buy a house. I understand that. Um, I would encourage people to get, save up at least 20% down so you avoid the CMHC payment, that, that, uh, that cost. And also it gives you a cushion in case houses have a correction. They have had a correction before and they will likely have corrections again. And, but some other things, an automobile. Maybe you have to buy, borrow to buy a car once. But what I'd say is, let's say you get a new car. Keep that car for 10 or 12 years, let's say 10 years minimum. Pay it off within four or five. And then over the next four to six years, save up enough money to buy your next car. It doesn't have to necessarily be new. But make it so that you don't have a car loan payment all your life. I've helped lots of people get out of debt and start saving for their future needs, and it's just, it's just a great feeling. By the way, I've helped uh, hundreds of people eliminate debt completely, and I'm talking no credit cards, no lines of credit, no, no car loan, no mortgages, nothing, and no one's ever come back and said, Tom, we really missed that mortgage payment. Or Tom, those, those, those two car loan payments, we really wish we had them. No one ever came that back and said that. Tom, we got all this surplus cash flow each month. We praise the Lord. We can give more to God's work. We can take that special family vacation. We can do all kinds of things. So um, debt causes stress, and it reduces your options, and you can easily become a servant to the lender. God wants us to serve him, of course. Here's some steps to get out of debt. The first thing is to pray and ask God for his wisdom and his direction. Um, James says, if any of us lack wisdom, we all lack wisdom, and we should ask God and he'll give it to us abundantly. Uh, why do I say that? That's step number one, because for one couple and another couple versus another individual, it can be different. For some people, if they're accumulating debt, you just have to go through and eliminate their discretionary expenses. For others, you may have to downsize from two cars to one. Other people, to get their finances in order, may have to downsize their house. There's different things uh, that, uh, that, that be can, can be used, and for some, they can increase their income, and if that is possible, then, then that's fine. But there, you need God's specific wisdom and direction. Regularly study and meditate on God's word. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. As you pray through, through scripture, you can, you can pray through and look at 100 scriptures. Um, I think of a couple recently, they, were, they, had, they had followed, gone through our course, financial management, God's way, became totally debt-free and no mortgage, nothing, and then they were thinking about getting a bigger house. They thought it'd be a good investment, and it'd be nice to have a bigger house. And as they started praying, they looked about 100, 200 verses on what the Bible says on finances. The ones that dealt with contentment jumped out at them. Well, John the Baptist said, be content with your pay. Hebrews 13, 5 says, keep your lives free from the love of money. Be content with what you have. Uh, godliness with contentment is great gain. There's lots of scriptures on it. And it's just like when those scriptures jumped out at them, they knew that God was telling them to just be content with what they had. Um, and that's, that's something we need to do as we go through God's word. Let him speak to us through his word. The next thing to do to get out of debt is evaluate where you're at financially. Be sure you know the condition of your flocks. Give careful attention to your herds. Remember at that time, people were farmers. So the modern day application of this is know where you're at financially. So often we sit down with individuals or couples, they make X plus Y added together. It's more than enough income, but they have no idea where their money's going. So one thing I'll be suggesting later, um, and as part number four, they're developing and implementing a budget, is just start tracking your expenses. So at least you know what your financial facts are, as opposed to guessing. The next point is, this is a key one. Ask God to enable you to be content with his provision. We know how committed the Apostle Paul was. In Philippians 4, Paul said, For I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Paul had to learn to be content, and so do we. Um, I've learned the secret of being content in any of every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or want, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. So the question I ask is, what was Paul's secret to learning contentment? What was Paul's secret to learning contentment? It's given in the last verse. I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength. In other words, Paul 
did he learn contentment contentment depending on the Lord Jesus Christ if you walk out of here and today and said I'm gonna learn contentment or you think you're gonna flick a switch I'm gonna be content from now on it's not probably not gonna be that easy it's something we have to learn we have to learn it depending upon the Lord we need the Lord to help us you need to pray a lot you need to spend a lot of time in God's Word allow God through his word and his spirit to change the way you think about money and material things um, it's a process it takes time and it also it, because Paul was focused on on Christ and he was depending on the Lord he was focused on things of eternal value as opposed to things of temporal value and I'll talk more about that later the next point, with your surplus of cash, pay off the most expensive debt first, such as credit cards, and depending on the Lord, follow up and persevere till you're debt free. God said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. I want to talk for a few minutes about budgeting. Budgeting doesn't sound like an exciting topic. Call it, call it developing a cash flow plan or a spending plan if you don't like the word budget. They're the same thing. But having some sort of a tool to track your expenses and project your, your, where your, your expenses next year are going to go and how are you going to make it so that you have a surplus each month to pay down debt and save for future needs, it's really key. If you don't do that and you just operate on guess, guesswork or, or, or your own personal desires, the odds are, in most cases, people will spend more than they make and accumulate debt. It's interesting, if you go to the parable of the tower in Luke 14, Christ admonished us to, t to plan ahead and planning, your head, uh, planning ahead can best be accomplished with a, with a, a budget or a, or a spending plan. And uh, very simply, the objective is to make sure that you spend less than you earn each month to have a surplus to pay down debt and pay for future needs. And as I mentioned, a, a budgeting system will provide you with the financial facts that you need to make wise decisions. Guesswork decisions and personal desires are dangerous. And investing the time, it really pays off. It really does pay off. This is sort of where the rubber meets the road. Are you managing your monthly cash flow according to what God wants you to do? Are you living within the income that God's given to you? Are you saving for next year's vacation? Are you saving for the annual insurance costs? Are you saving for retirement? Are you saving for your kid's education? If you don't get a handle on your monthly cash flow through a budget or a spending plan, then you're not gonna meet those medium and long-term goals. Um, the Copeland budgeting system, the price is right, it's free. You can download it from our website, and there's a 30-minute video there for you to, uh, to learn how to use it. So, um, and if you're not sure what to do, I always say start tracking your expenses. Um, if you track your expenses, you become more conscious of where your money's going, and when you do that, what'll happen is you'll spend less. Almost always you'll spend less, and especially if your spouse is going to see where the money's going, you'll spend even, even less. And it also gives you your financial facts. The next topic I'd like to talk about is godly counsel and wisdom. God admonishes us to obtain godly counsel. First from him personally, 1 Kings 22, 7, God said, uh, Joseph had said to the king of Israel, first seek the counsel of the Lord. That's the one we should go to first. The second place you should go is to God's word. Psalms 119, uh, 24 says, your statutes are my delight, they are my counselors. Uh, God's word has tremendous wisdom in, in the area of finances, uh, but most Christians have limited knowledge. And what we find is when people get into debt especially or get into trouble of some kind, 98% of the time they have violated some biblical financial principles. Yes, I know there can be some things that happen that are outside your control, and my heart goes out to those people. Um, but most of the time people have have uh, violated some biblical financial principles. And the other thing is get some godly counsel from a godly financial advisor. Do understand this, that all because someone's a Christian and they're a financial advisor, they may not give you biblically based financial advice. Um, unfortunately, most Christians, most Christian financial advisors have limited knowledge of what the Bible says on finances. And so most Christian financial advisors are actually giving worldly advice based upon their secular training. That's why there's no substitute for you learning what God's word says on finances. Uh, there's just no substitute. Remember, you're the one that's accountable to God as to how you manage the money God's entrusted to you. The advisor isn't. They're just simply an advisor to try to help you, help you along. What does God say about giving? Let's talk about that for a little bit. I think the key scripture is Proverbs 3, 9, and 10. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all your crops. The key is to make giving to God's work a priority. Um, why do I say that? I say that because often here's what happens with most people. 
They go out and they buy a nice house. They get a big house, they got a big mortgage. They get some new cars, they got two car loans, they got the credit, the line of credit, they run up the credit cards for a bit, and they use the line of credit, the debt restructuring to, to pay off the, the credit cards. It's, people's debt today is huge. Actually in Canada, I don't know if you know this, Canadians' personal debt right now as a percentage of disposable income is the highest in the world amongst individuals except for the people in Greece. We're even higher than the Americans, we're higher than the British by a considerable amount. As individuals, we have way more debt as a percentage of our disposable income. And um, it's, it's, that's going to spell trouble at some point, when we go into a recession or if we go into, uh, if, if interest rates go up. We, uh, we have radio, we have financial moments on radio stations across Canada. I can tell you, I get all kinds of emails of people hurting in the province of Alberta because the price of oil is down, they're losing their jobs, the price of real estate's dropping. They're hurting big time. And of course, the people with the most debt hurt the most, and sometimes they, they even lose their house. So give God the first fruits. And my point of making all that is often what Christians do is they buy the material things they want. And this is my point on this one. As the debt goes up, the giving goes down. I've sat, sat down with hundreds of individuals where they used to give 10% to the Lord's work. That's the guideline. It's not a legalism, but they used to do it. Today, they're giving 1% or 2% because they've taken on all these debts. And what happens when it comes to the end of the month, they got so much money in the bank and they got a big mortgage payment, which maybe should be a lot less, or they got two car loans. Maybe they shouldn't have those. Um, and they also want to give to their, their church and, and parachurch organizations. What do they do first? They pay their debts first, and they give God the leftovers, whatever's left over. And often the mindset is, we'll catch up on that later. But normally people that are buying things they cannot afford and accumulating debt, it normally does not get caught up on. Um, so make sure that you give God the first fruits. Give sacrificially and uh, give cheerfully. Remember this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Each man should give what he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. I'm going to talk about giving here for a minute. Um, because some people say to me, like some people are very legalistic on the tithe. I'm actually not legalistic on the tithe. If, if you're legalistic on the tithe uh, and you believe Mosaic law applies, you should give three tithes. There's the Levite tithe. Uh, in Leviticus, there's the festive tithe, and there's a poor tithe every three years. Uh, so it's 23 and a third percent is what the Jews gave at that time. It was actually, a, the government was theocratic, so it was all, not just a tithe, it was actually a for, almost a form of taxation. I believe as, and under New Testament, we're under, we're under grace. I think giving 10% is still the guideline. You shouldn't ignore that. And I believe people in this country with average or above average income should be giving at least 10%. But to a single mom with two or three kids and 20,000 years of in 20, a year of income, I would never try to convict her that if she doesn't give 10%, that she's robbing God. Her giving three or 4% out of her $20,000 of income is sacrificial giving, and I believe God will reward that tremendously in heaven. But I do say this to high income earners or above average income earners, don't be constrained by the 10%. Don't let the 10% constrain you. When we get to heaven, if you've, been, if you've been entrusted with a large amount of income and you're just giving 10%, that's good. That's giving out of obedience, but it's not really giving generously and it's not giving sacrificially. There'll be some rewards, but I think there'll be more rewards for the widow or the, the single mom who's giving sacrificially as opposed to the high income earner that's just giving um, a, a portion of, of what they have. It's, it's, not, it's not the same. And I think God looks at the facts of each circumstance. Here's the key. Make the paradigm shift from focusing on things of eternal value to things of temporal value. Jesus said, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust do not destroy and thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. The key is to make, I think overall on finances, make the paradigm shift. Focus on things of eternal value as opposed to things that are temporal. Understand this, if you're planning to buy some material thing, if you really don't need it, pray and ask God what he wants you to do. It may be that God will say, don't buy that material thing, give that money to his work, and think about it this way. If one person comes to know Christ because you gave money to God's work, a thousand years from now, that'll mean something. The material thing that you bought will probably wear out in five or 10 years. It's very temporary in nature. So try to have a focus on things of eternal value as opposed to temporal things. I'm going to talk about godly versus worldly motives for just a little bit. The Bible has a clear distinction on these. Proverbs 16.2 says, A man's ways seem innocent to him, but motives are weighed by the Lord. So sometimes it's not just what we do, it's actually our motives as well. That's, that's important. God is very concerned about our motives. Look what Paul said. 
People who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge men into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, I'm going to stop there for a minute. Many Christians quote this, or many people believe that you Christians think money's the root of all evil. That's not what it says. It says the love of money. It's that ungodly attitude towards money. It's greed, it's selfishness, covetousness. It's those kinds of things that is a root of all kinds of evil. That's what Paul is getting at. Nothing wrong with money in and of itself. It's actually neutral. Money can be used to expand God's kingdom for good things. Money can be used for things that are contrary to God's word. So question, do some Christians have an issue with the love of money? Do some Christians have an issue with the love of money? What do you think? Paul answers in the next verse. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. Even Christians can struggle with the love of money. And uh, here's some indicators of the love of money. Excessive hard work. And what I'm thinking of there is when somebody's working excessively hard to get more and more material things to the point that they have very limited time with God each day. They're not focused on their relationship with the Lord. Uh, they have little or no involvement in ministry. Um, and they're often very giving very little to God's work. These kinds of things, these four kinds of things, these five things can, can be an indication that someone is struggling with the love of money. And also a selfish lifestyle um, with no desire to seek God's will is another one. If you remember the parable of the rich fool, this is a farmer who had an incredible crop come in one year. And rather than, and maybe you've had some bonuses or maybe you've had a chunk of income or an increase in, in pay that you didn't anticipate or maybe you did, but you've been blessed by God. This, this farmer, rather than looking up to the Lord and saying, Father, what do you want me to do with this surplus? He says, I know what I'll do. I'll tear down all my barns, I'll build bigger ones, and I'll store all these grains up for me for many years, and I'll take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. Very selfish attitude. He clearly had an issue with the love of money and material things, and actually he was trusting in his material things. And one last warning, regardless of how much money and material possessions someone has, the attitude of the love of money will never be satisfied. Whoever loves money never has money enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with his income. Some other worldly attitudes that give rise to financial problems would be covetousness. That's when you want what someone else has. And of course, Exodus says, do not covet your neighbor's ox or his donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Often people are buying things because they're coveting what someone else has. And often they're doing it with debt. A lack of contentment, greed, selfishness, and pride. Often people buy things just because they feel that they, they want to feel as good or better than other people. That's, that's, the, that's a worldly motive. It's not a godly motive. And these worldly attitudes or motives, if they're not dealt with, they can lead, lead to some very significant financial problems. So here's the corresponding godly attitudes or motives with respect to money and material things. Contentment's a big one. Paul said, godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world. We shall take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Paul's saying, being content with God meeting your needs. That's what he's saying. Giving generously is a, is a godly attitude. Uh, being unselfish is one, thankfulness to God, of course, and humility. And I'd say this, godly thinking will lead to God's blessings both here on earth and in eternity. Matthew 16, 27 is, is a great verse uh, that says that the Lord will return in his Father's glory with his angels, and he will reward each person according to what they have done. Part of those rewards unequivocally is going to be how you spend the money that God's entrusted to you and, of course, how you spend the time that God's entrusted to you. We, we need to be stewards and, and taking an eternal perspective on this. How to deal with worldly attitudes or motives towards money and material things? I give you two key verses. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You need to renew your mind. You need to change the way you think about money and material things. And how do you do that? Joshua 1, 8 gives the answer. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. I find the key is getting for people, God's people, to get into God's word. Hebrews 4.12 says the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It's powerful. It's truth. Often Christians are believing things that are from the world, their financial deceptions, as opposed to believing God's truth. And it's getting into God's word how God can change the way you think. I don't believe I've changed the way anybody thinks or anybody's life, but I know that God's word will not come back empty, but will accomplish what he desires and fulfill the purpose for which he sent it, Isaiah 55, 11. God's word is powerful. And the last area I'd like to talk about is estate planning, biblically-based estate planning. 
And this applies to everybody. Now, I know if it's, it's more applicable of greater interest, people 55 plus, but even those that are younger, you still, you don't know when your time's gonna come. But this is important. Um, your estate plan, and in particular your will, is what I called your last act of stewardship. It's the final thing that determines where your assets are going after you leave this earth. God's word has scriptures that apply to estate planning, but I find most Christians are totally unaware of what those scriptures are. Most Christians do not pray and ask God for his wisdom. They don't search God's word. They don't seek biblical counsel. Rather, they just obtain the standard secular will. In other words, what happens? The husband might say to the wife, Honey, we haven't updated our will for 15, 20 years. Let's go to Joe Blow, lawyer down the street. He does them cheap. They go in and see him. We want a will. Just give us an updated will. And they do the standard secular will. He dies. Everything goes to her. She dies. Everything goes to him. They both die. It goes equally amongst their kids. There's, there's, there's nothing allocated for the Lord's work, mainly because they don't think about it. Um, and there's nothing, there's no consideration of how the kids manage money or what impact it'll have on them. It's interesting, I'm a member of Advisors with Purpose, and they did a survey uh, throughout Canada that, that revealed that 85% of Christians have not done any basic estate planning, as they'd call it, by including the Lord's work in their will. But what's interesting, they also found when they asked people, and people understood they should, um, that once they understood that they should and that they could, they actually would do it. They would go ahead and do it. And uh, I find also most Christians do not take into account the money management of skills of their kids. If you've got three kids and one squanders money, do you think it's good biblical stewardship to just give them their one-third and let them squander it after you die? That's not, that's not true. That's, that's, that's bad stewardship. Look at the parable of the talents. Um, there's ways to deal with that such as a, uh, setting up a trust pursuant to the will, or, or having um, an annuity paid to that child over, over their lifetime. And in some cases, if the Lord leads, you may even give them less than some of the other ones. That's what the parable of talents is all about. God entrusted different amounts to different people. Um, estate planning is a half-day workshop on itself. I just wanted to give you a, a little bit of a, a, a touch on this. So um, there's lots of other things to deal with in estate planning. So here's my summary on, on absolutely everything. Um, not just estate planning, all the things we've talked about. We are stewards of what God's entrusted to us, and therefore we should look to the owner, that is God, in discerning all of the important financial decisions um, that we make. First Corinthians 4.2 said, It is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. Faithfulness to God is the key. Are you managing the money? Are you using the money that God's entrusted to you according to his biblical principles and according to his specific will? for your life. Um, that's, that's the key here. I'd encourage follow-up. Um, study this handout would be one thing. Or visit our, our ministry website. There's lots of uh, materials that are available to help you understand what God's Word says on finances. I don't get a dime out of anything. I'm not in the business of selling this stuff. I make my living from my accounting practice uh, where I, I, we service private uh, owner-managed private corporations. Um, which generally is a, is, is a different group from who we minister to. We minister to absolutely everyone. They're typically more middle income and lower income, but sometimes they're higher income too. Um, and from the ministry, I, I, don't, I don't get a dime from, from it, and I match every dollar that goes in. It's strictly something God's called me to do. The next thing I'd encourage you to do, develop and implement a budget. You can download it from the Copeland Budgeting System. Um, that's where the rubber meets the road. That can really, really help you. Uh, to, to actually start tracking expenses and make some wise financial decisions. I would refer you to the, uh, the last page of the handout. And in that last page, uh, we got a response form. And we'd just like your input uh, as to uh, whether, you, um, it, whether you'd like to... Um, first of all, the first question is, is if you'd, you'd like some of the financial moments. The financial moments a one-page summary of a biblical principle on finance. Um, if you tick that off, we'll, we'll put you on the Financial Moment email list. If you'd like some financial coaching, it's provided at no charge on a ministry basis. Um, I have about 25 to 30 uh, financial coaches that are trained, and we can help you with that. We normally um, ask you to uh, fill out the budgeting system as much as you can. If you'd like to participate in the small group study, Financial Management God's Way, that's based on my book. It's a comprehensive study. I'd encourage you to tick that off. And if you have some questions, just email them to, to uh, info at biblefinance.org. And, um, and if you'd like to attend a half-day workshop, write down what topics that you would, uh, you would be interested in. And, and that's, that's basically it. Uh, I want to thank you for your time. I'm going to leave you one last scripture um, in, in Luke 12, 48.
From everyone who's been given much, much will be expected, and from the one who's been entrusted with much, even much more will be asked. We in this country have been entrusted with a lot, and God is looking to us as Christians in this world to use the money that he's entrusted to us in a manner that's glorifying to him.